Uh, hello, my name is Bob Barker, uh, Managing Partner at Barker Gilmore, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, the mission at Barker Gilmore is to help uh, build, develop, and optimize legal and compliance departments. And, and you know, it's focused, you know, it's unwavering commitment to quality, uh, diversity, as well as uh, long-term success. And today's um, uh, webinar is, is part of that mission, as, as its focus is to um, provide some professional development to corporate uh, legal and compliance leaders uh, uh, through our GC Advantage program. Um, today's topic is building a world-class compliance department in today's complex business environment. So if that's the one that you came to see, stay. If, uh, if, if you're surprised, I um, hope you enjoy the topic. Um, we have the next upcoming webinars uh, we have are going to be uh, working with an executive search firm from the candidate's perspective, and then how to lead people who are one of your peers. We also have a library of pre-recorded on-demand webinars uh, available, and today's uh, uh, session will be recorded and added to that library in roughly three weeks. Um, and for those that uh, you are who registered or are attending, um, you will receive an email letting you know when that material is uploaded. Um, during the, the course of the, the session today, um, we encourage you to um, you know um, you know ask questions. Uh, at the bottom of the Zoom application, you'll see a Q&A icon. And so you can, um, you can also view questions that have already been submitted. Uh, if there's one that is aligned to the question that you have, you can just simply click uh, thumbs up. That way uh, the speakers will know that that's a, a, a very important um, topic that, that many people have questions on. Um, and we'll do our best to, to answer as many questions as, as possible through the session today. Um, and if there is any kind of technical issues, um, you can use the chat feature to communicate with our support team. Well, at this point, I'd like to uh, turn it over to, to Haiti Allinger, uh, Senior Advisor at Barker Gilmore and former Global Chief Compliance Officer for McDonald's. Thanks, Haiti. Thank you, Bob. Um, and welcome, everyone. I'm so pleased to see so many of you uh, willing to participate today, and uh, and hopefully we'll we'll give you some information that you can go back and use in your offices. Um, I, as Bob just said, I am the former Global Chief Compliance Officer at McDonald's. As a senior advisor currently with Barker Gilmore, I provide executive coaching, and I also assist compliance officers with their programs uh, on a variety of issues they may have um, with that they're working with or struggling with uh, currently. I'm very pleased today to present uh, this webinar along with Amy and Ling Ling. Um, the good thing is that you know we have a little variety here. Amy is a, a current chief compliance officer, uh, and Ling Ling is a general counsel and chief compliance officer. So um, you know it's a good mix of of what we see out in the market, um, typical for compliance officers. But at this mm -hmm. point, I would like to first turn it over for, to Amy and then Ling Ling, who will introduce themselves, and then we'll start the program. Amy. Yes, thanks, Haiti. Glad to be here today. So um, my role to the chief compliance officer role um, has been what you see often in the industry. I started out working in-house, um, sort of like in-house general counsel, spent 33 years in different federal agencies that all focus in the financial services area, including the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the SEC most recently, I met uh, Ling Ling at Treasury years ago. And so went from the GC role into the chief compliance officer focus and role um, about three years ago. So it's a natural transition and I'm sure we'll um, be talking a lot about today about the, the, the interplay between those two roles. And um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ling Ling. I'm currently the general counsel and vice president for ethics and compliance at Georgia Tech. Um, for those of you who may not know, Georgia Tech is a public university located in the heart of the city of Atlanta. Um, and um, I, joined, uh, I joined Georgia Tech about two and a half years ago. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, shout out to any Georgia Tech alumni who may be watching today, go Jackets. 
Um, but my uh, prior job was at Panasonic, where I was their chief compliance officer. And um, I haven't had yet the opportunity to actually move into a role in compliance um, where the program was already built out and very mature. I've always joined um, companies where they want a compliance program. So it was sort of building it out from scratch. Um, at Panasonic, you know, I first joined their automotive division. They had some antitrust issues and required a program with that sort of focus and then moved to the parent organization for North America to build out something similar. Um, at Georgia Tech, the, the task at hand was to build out a compliance program that looked like what you would see in, in the corporate world. They really wanted to kind of mirror what you see in some of these world-class programs as you see um, in, in corporations. So it's been an interesting adventure. Um, although I, I have a dual title of um, general counsel and vice president of ethics and compliance, I did at the outset um, appoint a uh, chief compliance officer separate from me. Just having been in that role, I know it is a separate role in many ways when you're sort of building out a team, you need that 100% focus, but um, have learned a lot and really happy to, to join everyone today to, to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, Ling Ling. Uh, you know, similar to me, I started the function at McDonald's. So uh, one of the reasons I picked this topic was because I feel and know that the ethics and compliance function really has evolved and it's expanded over the past 10 years. Um, it's, it's really now front and center in many organizations with greater expanded responsibilities for the, act, for the chief compliance officer. Frankly, um, you know, today a chief compliance officer is required really to have the foresight to work through challenges that are faced by their companies and, and to really, and to have a set of solutions in place in, in a case of a crisis. You know, it, the last year is a prime example of that. You know, how the expectations they had for a, chi a chief compliance officer to step up and assist the business in addressing the crisis related risks associated with that pand pandemic. And while still performing their general compliance work. Uh, many of my clients through Bark Gilmore work have, have learned and have worked and developed better relationships with their HR counterparts as a result. Many are also now struggling uh, and it, to be included in strategic business planning discussions, while some have already penetrated that area. Um, and they're having an, and, and they're truly having an impact uh, in when they do that by assisting um, the organization and positioning them uh, to avoid costly compliance failures. Uh, and also to provide some proactive compliance and risk mitigation guidance. Uh, frankly, if you are not one of those CCOs who are included in the strategic business planning with your organization, then you need to look for ways to be included in that discussion. That's the reason, I, uh, part of the reason I have, the, I, I put this um, webinar together because um, it's a very important part of the function for a compliance officer today. I read a great article years ago uh, in Compliance Week magazine by um, Jacqueline Jager. Uh, but while, the, while it was a few years ago, the principles that she uh, put forth are still valid. And that is that in order to become a strategic business partner in, with the compliance team, for the compliance team is frankly to first of all, you have to express an interest in participating in the planning strategic planning discussions. And you need to explain to your CEO uh, the strategic value that compliance <laughs> can deliver. Um, you should review the strategy plan for your company and come up with new or different ways for handling compliance risks. You should also continue, and this, I know every compliance officer, every general counsel knows this, build and leverage your relationships with the business leaders and you know, help them identify and mitigate the risks within their areas of control. You should also define or redefine the scope of compliance across the organization and maybe build partnerships with compliance owners to ensure that the compliance issues they're dealing with are being managed effectively. Uh, another thing that you can do is implement effic efficiency uh, and initiatives to improve the effectiveness of your program and the function and reduce compliance costs. Uh, and finally, focus on new and emerging risks for the company and work on how to structure a compliance program to help mitigate those potential issues. This is the reason I put this uh, session together because Ling Ling and Amy are both able to address these issues. So I'm going to just ask some questions and, and ask Ling Ling and Amy to respond, um, hopefully in assisting you in, in, in learning some a little bit about what they're doing. So the first question is, uh, you know, how have you adapted your compliance program to today's business environment? And a dual on that, what strategies would you recommend for compliance management? Lingling, would you like to take that, please? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think we we can't talk about today's business environment without mentioning you know the pandemic. Um, I think that has disrupted a lot of the way all functions operate, and that um, and compliance is really really no exception. Um, so I think what has really changed for me is you know we all know sort of the nuts and bolts of the compliance program. You have this monitoring you know, uh, responsibility, there's a tracking responsibility, there's a training responsibility. And the more strategic programs tend to also have this enhanced ability to see around corners. And I think what's really changed over this last year is that has become a much more pronounced um, portion of your program. Um, and what I think is a real positive development in making sure we sustain that, that uh, important function is partnering with your enterprise risk management function at your organization because you can't see around the corners if you're not also thinking about you know, risks that are emerging across your organization. Um, that's something I've noticed, not just where I work, but in other organizations as well, talking to fellow GCs, fellow chief ethics and compliance officers, that's a change that um, is probably gonna stick around for, for quite a long time. Um, and as well as this partnership aspect of compliance. I think for a long time, it was a functional group that sort of had this one task and they were really isolated from the rest of the business. Um, and I think over time, you've seen an evolution of a compliance program or a compliance professional going from enforcer to influencer, and now we're enablers. And the enabling piece is really important when you talk about partnership and it's trying to help other units that have compliance pieces in their shop um, understand they have to manage that and own that as well, that the compliance team isn't the sole, you know, compliance staff or the entire company. It really is a, a uh, distributed sort of responsibility. Um, but I think the current business environment does compel us to work more closely now with our, our risk teams. Um, and I'm sure um, some of the people on, on this webinar have noticed that, uh, that trend as well. Amy, any additional comments on that? Yeah, um, I, I wanted to, I agree with everything when you said, and I also, I think, um, you know, some of this is really dependent on the size of your organization and the sophistication of your organization. Obviously, there's a huge difference between managing a compliance program at a global, you know, highly regulated industry participant like a pharma company versus, uh, you know, medium-sized company um, versus a, a, a medium-sized privately held business in the financial services market, like where I currently am at Gerstel Law Firm. So it, I think you have to, when you look at management of a compliance program, you have to also look at the context you're in and you don't, you know, and adjust your management to the circumstances you're in, obviously. Um, I, I think that that strategic partnership with, with the business unit um, owners and leaders of the firm, of the company that you're with or the, the enterprise, I think is the most important thing um, that as certainly any leader of a compliance program should be focused on. Um, I think that that is critically important to the success of the program and to helping it not be just a check the box kind of an exercise for um, you know, the basic th the things that we have to do. And instead, really, um, you really bring insights and value to the company, to the enterprise. Thank you, Amy. You know, so how have you developed the strategic vision for your compliance department, Amy? <laughs> yeah, well, I've been at the law firm for about a year now. <clears throat> so I've, I really had to kind of create that from ground up. I think that, um, you know, like many um, smaller enterprises, that it, it was a a compliance program, but not that strategic level of vision. And I, I think of it as, and just so you understand our context, we're in a highly regulated industry in the financial services area, and we're a privately held company, so and, and not a huge company. So compliance is a, a large cost to an enterprise like that, but it it is, um, you know, it doesn't drive the business in a way, but it actually does, because um, our business is dependent upon us being compliant um, and we can lose business if we're not. So I, in my context, use that as an, to your advantage in terms of creating that strategic um, approach when you go into the executive suite. Um, the, what I focused on when I started was several different areas. One is the vision for the culture of the organization. Um, we, we had a strong um, culture already and how can I 
add that add to that to make it even more strategic and, and valuable to the company. Um, also, themes for our own department. Um, strategic vision for our own department. I think sometimes we forget that. We're also a leader of people and process within our own group. Um, so it's external to the rest of the organization and also internal to our team. Um, and then also relating the mission of the compliance program to the overall business objectives of the company. Um, in our case, um, like I said, it is related to our business, our market share, um, and I think, you know, that all that that business um, association or connection really has to do with the unique compliance risks of your particular organization. And as the more you tailor it to that, the more meaningful it's going to be for your executive suite folks. Um, the CEO um, of my company now is, you know, really appreciates that bringing any insights to him that is directly related to our business. So it's not just theoretical, this is best practice for the for a compliance program, but how does that relate to our particular business? Um, so those are some of the things that I've done um, at this Thank current you. job. Thank you, Amy. And you know, in line with that then, what are the key issues companies should be addressing as part of the compliance strategy, Ling Ling? Well, I think if I sort of think about, you know, today's business environment, the key issues that sort of rise to the top of the order of priority for me, at least, um, number one would be cyber and IT security risks. Um, I think that's probably similar to a lot of people's order of uh, priority um, today, um, especially if you work in an organization that has a lot of research and development um, or work in an organization like I do where there's a lot of um, research collaborations, um, there's the threat of sort of IP theft always. Um, and that's something that has always been top of mind for me. And then of course, as we've all pivoted to remote work and um, being able to work anywhere with our computers is a huge luxury, but also comes with some security, heightened security risk as well. So for those reasons, uh, if, if, if you're not thinking about cyber and IT security as a, as a, as a high priority, um, I would say you should probably start doing that and start alerting you know, those in your organizations who have oversight um, and especially um, resource allocation um, authority over those uh, particular functions to really start thinking about how to make those enhancements. Um, flowing down from that, I think third party risks are still at the very top of the order of priority because of these cyber and IT concerns. Um, we're in an age where we're sort of outsourcing a lot of our data storage and, and, and data functions. And you wanna make sure that as you're enhancing your own security network um, at your organization that the people that you're partnering with, the organizations that you're partnering with are similarly doing that. Um, because as you know, under the sort of um, uh, structure of liability and exposure, you know, you're gonna be responsible for, for the data that you are sending out to be sort of managed and handled and processed by these third parties. Um, mm -hmm. Then I think a third layer of this is just crisis management. I think that needs to be a core component now of most compliance programs. Um, we have now gone through a, a crisis worldwide that has required us to really take a hard look at our business continuity plans and our ability to be very nimble um, in terms of pivoting our business strategy, our operations. And so uh, to echo kind of what um, was said earlier today, you know, you really need to be a strategic sort of player in this space and make sure you're folding in crisis management into your strategic plan as well. I mean, the best compliance program strategic plans are totally aligned with the strategic plan of the business. Um, so you wanna make sure you are adapting and, and making modifications so that your program is relevant and, and helpful um, and not so more off the mark and more you know, academic or theoretical. You really want it to be practical. Yes, thank you, Lin Ling. In addition to that, you know, I think we have to also continue as part of any compliance strategy um, and even if you're starting a new compliance function with you, within your organization, is to continue to work on that culture. Uh, I am constantly surprised when I see yet another um, news article about a company whose culture uh, was so, um, so, so embroiled in issues that uh, you would think that today they would, we would be beyond them. But um, I just read another article about another company in California um, who, does the, who is part of a gaming uh, concept, a gaming company that has just been embroiled in, in another issue. And again, that had a lot to do with culture from the top on down. 
um, and the um, the continuing struggle that we as compliance officers and, and general counsels in getting people to speak up, you know, talk about these issues. And when someone does speak up, listen to them, do something about it. I mean, uh, people are beginning to lose their jobs at that company from what I read. And, uh, you know, and, and that is really the basis for any compliance program. But certainly, um, you know, I know cyber IT, I keep hearing those as well. And, 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 and great advice, Lynn Lynn. Um, another question then, have you seen a change in management's attention to compliance over that over this last year? And do you expect that attention to continue? And I ask that because, um, you know, typically people are, are, are just content to have compliance do what they have to do. And, and you know, don't, don't talk to me or don't bother me about it as long as we're in great shape and we don't have any issues. Um, have you seen a, a change in that attention? Ling Ling, and, and then maybe Amy, if you could tag onto that. Um. I've seen a greater appreciation for, for risk assessments really driving the compliance strategy um, and an opening of the doors, I, I guess is the right way to say it, um, uh, for the compliance program to have a better view into kind of what's going on more broadly. Um, and I think that's going to stick around. Um, and again, I think one uh, result uh, or one you know, um, long-standing, permanent, I think, change with regard to compliance as a result of the pandemic is this also appreciation that this is a shared responsibility. Because we saw in responding to the pandemic, every company had to take a coordinated approach. It wasn't just one function's responsibility to make all these adjustments that needed to be made or to care for all the employee issues and safety issues. It was everyone's responsibility. And I think that has also emerged um, with regard to the way executives and business leaders look at compliance, they understand it is a coordinated, a coordinated effort. And so I'm finding less resistance when I reach out to different departments and units to join and participate in a lot of these compliance exercises. I, I, I sense a lost, I, I see a less, much less resistance and much more actually willingness to, to be a part of this because of that coordinated collective sort of feeling that we're all responsible when there are issues. So that's that's here to stay, I think, I hope. Thank you. Amy? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I would encourage anyone listening to, to do everything in their power to continue that by sheer force of influence and, um, you know, continuing to bring um, insightful insights and, you know, in, interesting new concepts and, and, you know, the more, the more you can bring informed insights and, and value um, to those folks that you're reaching out to, the more willing they are going to be to have you continuing to come in and, and working with them on these joint problems. And I think the conversation about risk, I agree with you, Ling Ling, that that's, you know, kind of a, we, the compliance program has a unique ability to talk about risk. And we see it every day, we evaluate it, we analyze it. And, and if we're doing our jobs, um, we should be bringing insights about risk to the leaders throughout the company, whether that's at the top of the organization or, or business unit leaders at any level. And the more that we bring those insights, the more value we're going to um, bring to them and that they will be encouraged to continue to have us there because we're giving them insights that they don't have. Um, so I, I, that's what I, that's really what I focus on. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the pandemic and, and other related things also just are encouraging more resilience and more creativity. Um, which are skills that we as compliance folks can also um, perfect and work on among ourselves and not take an auditing approach to everything. You know, we have to build in that creativity as part of our program as well. And I think that bringing that to um, leaders is um, kind of refreshing to them and also valuable to them. Thank you. Thank you. You know, another area that uh, I always, uh, um, I'm always questioning and I always talk to my um, clients about is the use of technology, you know, and how are you using technology to transform your compliance departments in light of the changing operational challenges? Uh, and, you know, everybody's talking about technology, just curious as, as to what you're working on in your individual areas. Ling Ling? Um, I think technology <clears throat> is really relevant today in terms of this culture piece that you mentioned, Haiti. <clears throat> There's so much loss in not having sort of face-to-face -face interactions and the ability to have on-site training, um, the ability to onboard new employees in person, you know, as that first interaction. 
um, to kind of set the tone, introduce people to the values of, of, of the company. Um, so I think that's where we're really looking um, and have made you know, investments in technology. Um, there are lots of really amazing innovations that have come out of the pandemic to help facilitate continued meaningful engagement with employees. I've seen a lot of really interesting virtual interactive platforms. Um, so not just the typical sort of Zoom or, or WebEx or whatnot, but there's, there's one and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll sing the praises of this one because it was developed by Georgia Tech students, but it's called Gatherly, you know, and it's an amazing platform that simulates a conference environment where you are put into a room um, and you can see where you're at, you're, you're like a circle and you can drag yourself to other rooms um, with other people to have sort of one-on-one -on -one conversations or group discussions at any time, sort of in real time. And those are the tools that we're investing in to bring into our ethics and compliance programming. You know, when we put on events, uh, if we don't have the option of putting everybody in a large auditorium, we can use the Gatherly platform instead and not lose that candid informal discussions that are really helpful in, in learning about why this is important. Um, and then of course, with, with on, on the training piece as well, um, we're doing a lot more videos um, instead of sort of uh, slides, um, videos like, you know, like movie type videos um, where you're watching things unfold in front of you. I guess everyone's been watching a lot of, a lot of uh, TV and, and movies this past year. So we sort of were inspired by that to kind of continue with that trend. But I think that's where you're really gonna see um, the ability to ensure you're not losing the, the culture that you've built um, over these you know, decades, however long you've been working in, in this field. Um, but you're going to have to adapt and embrace new ways of connecting with your employees. Yes, thank you. And, you know, in line with what you were just saying, uh, Ling Ling uh, and, and Amy, um, you know, we have, an, we have a question here. You know, what tips do you have for vendor compliance? You know, speaks to third parties. It looks like perhaps contractual changes would be a start on what you expect from them to meet business needs. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, well, I, I'll jump in here. Um, it, it, given that we're in this regulated, highly regulated industry, financial services, um, our uh, regulatory expectations, both for us as an entity, as well as from our clients, um, we're a law firm that represents creditors. Our clients ex have expectations of us in this regard too. So we do have a robust vendor management program and um, definitely starting with mandatory templated language um, for services contracts is a really good way to start. We've, we've kind of come up with a template that includes all of the requirements that we've gathered from you know, client requirements, um, regulatory requirements, and built it into a template that we then give to our vendors. Um, luckily, we're, we're in a smaller industry, so we have some vendors who are willing to negotiate and provide those things to us because we really couldn't use them if they didn't offer those things, um, especially if they have consumer data or um, you know, confidential information from the law firm. So use your use your um, your I guess bargaining power depending on which vendors. You know, obviously some vendors are going to be like, if you want to use our services, here's our contract, sign it, and that's it. Um, but w for those vendors that we have authority to really negotiate or the ability, we we mandate different provisions, and that's one thing we do with vendor management. Um, another is that we do we have a robust auditing program. Um, we do on-site audits for some of our vendors. We kind of tier them by risk area um, and, and client requirements again, and then we, we audit them at different levels. Some are just a paper audit, some are on-site and paper. On-site, um, speaking of technology, we've used uh, um, Zoom to do our on-site reviews um, this past year because we obviously can't go, couldn't go on-site. So those are, those are some strategies that we use with our vendor uh, management program. Thank you, thank you. There is one other question and, and we can answer it. Uh, for the role of chief compliance officer, is, re is it required that um, they are also legal counsel or have a law legal degree? Um, I'll, I'll start if you have another, I, if you, the two of you wanna input, that's fine. I have had a couple of uh, clients who are not lawyers, um, who are chief compliance officers, but I typically do see chief compliance officers as lawyers, especially in highly regulated industries where the expectation is that you will be, um, you know, com working on compliance uh, uh, under federal laws and federal rules. Um, but, you know, 
I, I think it also depends on what the company wants um, and in what type of an organization it is. But certainly, I've seen it more often than not that it is that you are someone who's in the legal fee function uh, at some point. Accountants, uh, you know, someone who is also in the risk area could be a compliance officer, and, and perhaps that's someone with an accounting degree. So in that instance, maybe they they don't have to have that legal degree. Um, so another question: What is your role in ESG, and do you see that? Uh, falling within the compliance role? That's a great question. Um, any of either one of you want to take that one? Well, I, if, if, if it's all right, I'd like to go back to the question that you just answered about the, <laughs> the law degree, because that has been coming up a lot. And there's yes. a growing sort of contingency and argument for not requiring a law degree of a chief compliance officer. And I'm I try to stay sort of relevant and, and in the know about sort of what employers are looking for. And when I look through job descriptions for chief ethics and compliance officers, you do see more of them saying a JD is preferred, you know, but not required. And I think ultimately it comes down to what you're talking about. Where does that function live in the organization? What is it responsible for? Who does it report to? I think all those things are factored into is a law degree actually necessary? You know, in, in my compliance program at Georgia Tech, the chief ethics and compliance officer oversees some key legal programs. Um, our privacy program, our export compliance program that do have a lot of regulatory and statutory uh, requirements. Um, so for that reason, you know, that person in that role does have a law degree. Uh, but there are other components of the program that this person oversees that don't, requ don't require a law degree. You know, they, they oversee the, um, you know, sort of conflicts of interest process, um, the training program, the employee engagement piece of things, the administration of our hotline, you know, and if a chief ethics and compliance officer role at an organization really is, is, is uh, encompassing those sorts of non-type legal issues and operations and programs, it absolutely wouldn't be appropriate to consider a non-lawyer for the role. So it really just depends. Um, I do think that over time, you're going to see the chief ethics and compliance officer role sort of growing its own legs and being really sort of less tied to the general counsel. Um, you know, kind of going back to what I talked about earlier, you know, having been in the chief compliance officer seat, I can really appreciate how rigorous and, and demanding that role is. And so when I took on this job at Georgia Tech, I intentionally created a chief compliance officer role that's separate from me because I think it demands a, a person's singular attention. And I think over time, you're going to see a lot less of these dual hatted roles um, because I think the function is growing in terms of importance. Um, there's this expectation now that it is strategic, just like we we're talking about earlier today. So I do think over time, there's going to be a separation of those roles. So they're not so, so uh, intertwined with, with the general counsel, with the general counsel role. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. What about the role of ESG? Uh, and how do you see that? Do you see that falling within the, the compliance role? Um, for me, I, 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 being a small um, privately held company, I, I don't see that a direct tie in there. Um, but I can, you know, I certainly have been reading a lot about it in terms of the, the larger market uh, marketplace of um, compliance programs. And I think that uh, from what I've seen and heard, there is a, a greater tie in and especially with risk being associated or combined with ESG and the compliance programs and, and companies looking at that, um, that strategic synergy between those different functions. Exactly. I think, you know, I think it also comes in, uh, lately I've seen it coming in and more often as well. And I think it's, as we were discussing earlier, it's really part of a partnership. That's the role that the compliance can play in that, being a partner to the people in your, the sustainability group uh, in your governance, being a part of the governance. So uh, again, I think as you had just said, Ling Ling, um, the compliance function is becoming more strategic. It is and should continue to be integrated with other departments. It really can no longer be a standalone department just running its own uh, compliance function. So I think you're gonna see more um, compliance officers participating in those ESG discussions, participating um, in other roles in the organization. And that to me is the greatest way that this uh, function can, continues to develop. And you have to do it yourself in your company. You have to make sure you are up out there talking about how important it is uh, for you to be a part of it. Um, so, you know, 
in, in line with that then, how have you integrated the compliance function into the business, Amy? I know you said you just started. How are you doing that? Yeah, well, I, I, I'll speak to more than just my current role, but, you know, um, how, how I've seen it done over, over years. Um, you know, I think I, there's a lot of different techniques people can use. Um, I, I, I think that um, at, the, at the higher levels in the organization, meaning, at, you know, the chief compliance officer level, I think you really have to, um, as uh, Ling Ling used the term earlier, influencer, I think that is um, certainly my sort of mantra. And I think that every opportunity you have to talk with business unit owners and leaders and bring them those informed insights that I talked about earlier, um, talk about risks, um, what you're seeing and, and informing them about things that you're seeing, that it, it, the more insights you bring to them, the more likely they're gonna integrate with you. Um, and, and that's helpful. On a more kind of brass tacks level in terms of how to get folks to, to follow their compliance requirements, whether that be training requirements or um, in the government, it was financial disclosure reports um, that had to be filed at a certain time of the year, things like that. Um, there's um, things that I've seen happen through different agencies and that I've heard of where they might have performance expectations for managers that say, you know, if your team doesn't complete their compliance training, you're going to get dinged on your bonus or um, you're not eligible for a performance bonus if you, you know, don't do your own financial disclosure report. I mean, there's different ways you can tie it directly to things that impact somebody's bottom line, especially if they've let it go past the deadlines and multiple reminders and things, because that you're sort of using that as a way to affirm the culture. Um, you can also relate it to a business unit, um, say, um, in our context, consumer complaints, you know, if you have um, a, a, a large, you know, number of complaints that come up in a certain business unit or a certain office, you can relate that to the management of that office and say, you know, this is below expectations for your performance as a unit um, and, and tie it to that. So there's, there's a lot of different kind of angles you can go at to, to get compliance to um, be front and center with management. Thank you. You know, I, I, there is a comment that came through on that last discussion, Ling Ling. Uh, someone was saying that there is um, FERC in, in their compliance program at Best Practices White Paper actually speaks to how compliance and legal have different functions and regulatory uh, agencies may see a potential conflict when legal is acting as compliance. And that's true. I mean, even as, um, while I, well, I think the discussion is whether you should or should not be a lawyer. I think you can be a lawyer, but you probably may not be acting as a lawyer, even though you're, you're a legal department employee, maybe reporting to the GC. As a compliance officer at McDonald's, I reported to the GC. I am a lawyer. And while I, I was in that role, um, I was very cognizant to know, to realize that there were, that I was not a lawyer in certain functions. And I brought in um, at certain times, and, and frankly, probably was not acting as a lawyer in, in most of the cases, except for the fact that obviously I could read policies and laws and, and interpret them. Uh, but um, from that standpoint, I did always bring in maybe someone from our legal team to assist us with certain items and certain uh, things so that we could maintain that separation. And there would be someone who is truly legal, who, who has that uh, protections, uh, client, um, you know, the uh, privileged protections behind them. So a question then, um, you know, what recommendations or tips would you have on creating aiding an organization-wide collaboration and strategy on compliance. Uh, this, uh, you know, even if you're starting a new function as well. So um, any comments on that? Um, I, I would go at it from a risk perspective. Yes. I, I think that starting with risk and, and even just having a discussion about what risks the organization faces that are unique to that organization and its particular business and environment and industry and oversight by regulators and what have you. Um, if you bring those insights and say, you know, I, I would like to partner with you to, you know, manage those risks on a strategic level, on a, you know, on a 20,000 foot level kind of approach, um, you know, maybe folks would be interested in that because that relates directly to their business um, achievements. Um, that's, that's how I would start the conversation. 
And, you know, interesting, uh, there is a question on kind of similar to this, because I remember people, you know, when you're in our role, it's difficult to, you know, people, the business wants to know, you know, is this person says, so what's the risk? Um, you know, and responding with telling them that you're going to go to jail, that there's a potential fine or something like that. Sometimes that just doesn't resonate with them. So, you know, how do you um, get someone to to focus on on the risk without just saying, oh, you, we can get in trouble and get fined? Yeah. Um, I, I oh, No, no, go ahead, Amy. I, well, I was going to I would I would break it down to, like let's talk about the, the 10 different risk types there are. You know, there's reputation risk, there's litigation risk, there's regulatory risk in my industry. You know, um, they're very specifically describing the kinds of risks. So it, you got to get way beyond the conversation, which just is there's a risk here, because then you're going to perpetuate that notion that, you know, compliance just says no, or they just say it's risky, so we shouldn't do it. You know, you want to be partnering with the business unit so that they're still in the driver's seat unless you know unless it is one of those moments where you're like we cannot do this and i'll you know go to the mat so we can't but if it's more of a um, conversation about risk then you can ha it, it it lends itself to a more of a partnership with the business unit where you're saying it's a business choice but i you need to be informed about the risk and then you break it down to the kinds of risks so they really understand the insights that you're bringing to them that they may not have thought of. Yeah, and I can't undervalue at all the importance of emotional intelligence. You know, I think some of the most successful chief ethics and compliance officers score real high on, on, the, on the EQ spectrum. Um, and that's because to make compliance relevant um, and of any interest to, to someone else, um, you really have to drive down into what is that person's motivation. And that's what you sort of lean on as you're crafting your pitch for why this is something they have to value and prioritize. Um, you know, talking about fines and talking about, you know, going to jail just seems so, um, just seems so sort of unrealistic for some people. So that's why it doesn't resonate with them. Um, but you can sort of flip that script a little bit and talk about, the purpose of compliance is to protect the revenue you've already generated. You know, we don't want to work so hard to develop these amazing products and to, you know, develop really innovative, creative sales uh, channels and avenues only to have to turn around and take that all back to the government, you know? So it's just a matter of sort of packaging, <laughs> packaging it correctly so that it really speaks to what they are really uh, most motivated by and most driven by, you know, in performing their own role. Outstanding. Um, so, so you know, how, how do you monitor the effect? In, this is another uh, you know, struggle uh, that a lot of compliance and general counsels have. How do you monitor the effectiveness of your compliance program, Lingley? Um, there are many ways um, to monitor and measure um, the effectiveness of, of your program. I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind is every, every compliance program should have some type of helpline, hotline reporting system. And that's a wealth of data to sort of measure what's being reported. Is anything being reported? If no one's reporting anything, that's a problem as well. So just sort of taking a deep look at your reporting, uh, uh, your reporting tool is one way to help monitor and measure uh, if your program being effective. Um, there are lots of surveys you can do as well. You know, these compliance surveys, ethics surveys, culture surveys, you wanna try to do them annually. Um, to kind of test not only people's awareness of the program and what its purpose is, but also throw in some questions there that are sort of knowledge-based to really understand, to, to see, are you, are you learning from the training that we're, that we're doing, um, or is it just sort of a, a routine sort of exercise for you? Um, I would say another way is to look at um, internal audit and look at the findings they're coming um, out with when they're looking at specific functions to see if the controls that you've worked so hard to develop alongside internal audit to see if those are actually um, effective. And then I would say a close review and evaluation of your business's strategic plan to see if you have compliance elements woven into the strategic objectives for, for the business. I think that's really critical as well as a good indicator about where sort of the business is thinking in terms of is ethics and compliance important to them. Now, thank you very much. Outstanding. Um, Amy, do you have anything to add on that, uh, given that you are now beginning your function and 
you're probably looking to how you're going to show how effective it's been over the next couple of years. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I really echo um, the things that Ling Ling said. I, I think um, the only thing I would add to that is, is that I've got to um, make it tailored to my environment again, you know, so in, in my environment, what are the things that I'm trying to prevent as a program um, for, for our firm? Um, and then how can I measure those things in some way? Um, so uh, that, that's what we're still building out and looking for the right kind of data to show that. Um, I think I, I can't emphasize enough the, the importance of data and, and analytics of data. I think that's a, a real opportunity area that um, I'm, st I'm starting to see more discussions among, about that among um, compliance professionals. And I think it's really an untapped area. Um, I've seen from going to different uh, events that a lot of times the, a larger compliance program will have um, kind of multiple skill sets in its management group, um, the compliance program management group, including data anal analysis and, and um, you know, uh, visualization of data. Those kinds of tools are, uh, you know, you, once you have the data to be able to present it in a way that decision makers find insightful and interesting and relevant to their um, understanding of what the purpose of the compliance program is. Um, so I think that that's another opportunity area. Thank you. And in line with that, then, you know, there's a question here about how do you manage monitoring functions and allay fears of missing something? You know, do you hire separate monitoring analysts? Have either of you had it, that type of experience? Um, I think this kind of goes to this sort of coordinated effort, you know, that is really instrumental in effective compliance programs and that we can't be everywhere all the time. You know, our eyes, we only have one set of eyes. Um, and we have one body, we can't uh, it'd be great if we could clone ourselves and put ourselves in all, all corners of the organization, but that's just not um, realistic. And the fact of the matter is a lot of compliance programs are small. Um, you know, often people refer to compliance programs as small and scrappy because you have to be really resourceful with, with what you have. And so I would say here, this is where you got to leverage your ability to build really meaningful relationships across the organization and basically create almost like an extension of the program deep within each unit. You know, you wanna connect with each unit, find out who are the people that are just so well-informed and knowledgeable about things that are going on now and things that are coming down the pipe. And you, build, you fold them into your program. You make them like a liaison, you make them an ambassador, you make them some type of compliance officer um, so that they're reporting back to you the things that you just can't see. Um, and that's one way to kind of extend your network and extend your reach so that uh, you can um, mitigate and, and it, those, some, some of those concerns about not seeing everything. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then there is another yet another question here. There seems to be a significant amount of interface between risk and compliance. Should the compliance role sit within risk then? I, uh, from my knowledge, certain compliance officers are now becoming part of the risk and they're the ones taking over the risk function. Uh, but what have you two uh, seen or heard? I, I think that that makes a lot of sense in a smaller organization. Um, um, going back to my, you know, the things that I've already talked about, about risk, I think in a smaller organization, it kind of makes sense that the chief compliance officer would also be focused on risk. Um, in a larger organization, that may not be feasible. Um, and, but I certainly think, um, to your point, Katie, that it should be aligned and, and there, sh there shouldn't be they shouldn't be in two silos. There, there should be a, a close working relationship there, if not being on the risk assessment team, because um, compliance risk is a risk to the organization. So at a minimum, you should be feeding those risks into the enterprise uh, risk management program, if not having even a broader role than that. It, yes, and, and it, when I was with McDonald's, um, I was certainly a part of the enterprise risk team um, that fed into uh, the larger wide. Because if you think about some of the enterprise risks, they're, they're really associated with larger, maybe even business issues. For example, at McDonald's, maybe it was a supplier. You know, what happens if one of our major suppliers goes bankrupt? You know, that is a large enterprise risk that, um, that doesn't necessarily, you know, fall under a compliance function. Um, so I certainly feel that uh, if you are not participating in your, in, on your risk uh, enterprise risk um, teams at your companies, you should find a way to get in there uh, because a lot of what you do certainly should be feeding up to, into that 
that grid that everyone puts together about red, you know, and yellow and, and what quadrant the compliance risks fall into. And I think it helps your board understand the larger holistic organization rather than just one targeted uh, function. So, um, and, and get another question on, uh, on challenges and opportunities. And we've spoken a lot about some of the things you're both dealing with right now. Um, but what are the biggest challenges and opportunities that you feel or see chief compliance officers facing today? Um, you know, in addition to what you've said, any, any other points on that topic? Um, Ling Ling, any comments or, or of course, you know, Amy. I mean, I think it's just staying ahead of the curve, staying ahead of the curve and really leveraging the inputs and data that your risk team have been collecting and, and using that um, to, to direct kind of your, your priorities. Um, I think, as you've mentioned, Haiti, I think culture is gonna be a continuing challenge um, with a remote workforce um, and a distributed, you know, globally distributed workforce. Um, those are the things that uh, come, come to mind when I think about like current, current challenges for myself. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I would, I would, oh, just the, the next big thing, <laughs> trying to figure out what that may be, <laughs> dealing with the current big things and also what the next big things are. And I, I just think we've got to be plugged in to all kinds of things. You know, we've got to read widely. We've got to be curious, talk to people inside your industry, inside your company. What are you seeing? What are you worried about? You know, just, just try to be in jest a lot of information from a lot of different sources. And um, hopefully that'll help us see what the next big thing might be. Yeah, and I see there's, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just see a couple of questions about benchmarking tools. And mm -hmm. that's another sort of data point you can look at is what are other companies focusing on? And there are lots of great resources out there. I mean, some of them you have to pay for, so it depends on your budget. Um, but if you have budget, I would suggest joining um, at the Sphere. They're a great organization that does a lot of benchmarking. Um, the reports have been very helpful to me. Um, Gartner has a lot of really helpful tools as well. Um, and if you don't have budget, because um, I've certainly been in a situation where you know your executive asking for the best program ever, and they give you you know ten dollars, um, <laughs> do is really just sort of on your own convene your informal network. You know, look at all the companies in your vicinity. Um, and reach out to their compliance officers and say, hey, can we get together quarterly? Can we just talk about some of the things that you're dealing with? Because um, maybe there's something that you're missing. And likewise, they might be missing something that your, your, your company is, being, is, is focused on as well. And, you know, that's, that's free, you know, time with, yeah. I mean, time mm -hmm. is money, but at the same time, you're not having to pay for, you know, for, for that service as you would if you're going to get a subscription to, a, to a, a, an organization. It also helps when you're in the same industry because it, you know, you're, you're, you are dealing with the same issues. Uh, if you're in retail and you can find other retail organizations and companies and talk to their chief compliance officers, you're probably all dealing with the same type of thing, you know, um, you know labor shortages and, and those types of things. So um, it, that's very helpful. And, and I definitely recommend that it, again, if, and you're right, Ling Ling, if you don't have the money, uh, there really is no substitute for hearing how others are doing it. And sometimes when you talk to the business about what another company is doing, who they know may be in the same business, they'd like to hear that. Oh, is that what they're doing? So, you know, that's definitely, I, I would definitely put a plug in for that. And, and you can find the chief compliance officers to the companies. And I found when I was at McDonald's that uh, they were, we were always willing to benchmark and share, um, you know, program information uh, with each other. So th that's definitely a resource. And that's a point that kind of flows into something we talked about earlier. How do you convince your executives that this needs to be important? I'm generalizing here, but most CEOs, most, you know, chief business officers are highly competitive. And so if you're telling them that other companies are doing this and we're not, that in itself can be a really powerful motivator. Mm -hmm. And again, yeah, talk to you. Yeah, talking to your uh, management about um, the importance of, of your program and, and, and coming up with ideas that will help them. We were talking about risks earlier, and I think risks, that, that resonates with them. It resonates with them. It resonates with the board. And if you are showing your added value in the fact that you recognize them and that you are a student of the business, you understand your business, you understand, you know, what your business is, um, you know, what kind of risks you have as an organization. And you are out there trying to help them um, mitigate those risks uh, at, at whatever, at, at every possible turn. Uh, that certainly resonates. Um, and, you know, we're getting close to the end. Uh, I had so many more questions, but, you know, I, 
I, at this point, um, I'm sorry we weren't gonna be able to get to all the final answers. Let's see, uh, we talked about the monitoring. Uh, with the chief compliance officer, what are your thoughts on CHC certification? Should that be required? You know, I think it's a great certification. I, I don't see why, um, you know, if you have an opportunity to get it, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate for continuing education, for continuing your ability to improve yourself. And uh, whilst uh, companies may not require it, uh, if you feel comfortable doing so, go ahead. At the same time, you know, I think it's a plus for people to to show that they've gone that extra that extra mile. Um, and are there any news informational resources that you'd recommend around regulatory compliance? We use Gartner right now, but I'm looking for more of news updates type of resource. Do you know of any of that, Amy? And, and real quick, because I think we're coming towards the end. Yeah, I, I just, um, I, I really just get a lot of legal, you know, um, Law 360 is mm -hmm. a good one. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. you know, some sort of legal oriented and, and joint trade associations, they, mm -hmm. they, they give out newsletters. Any law firms often in the in the regulatory space, depending on your market, they they'll do newsletters. Just get just and read accounting firms. widely. Yeah. And accounting firms. And and exactly. Yeah. Just read all as much as possible about so, compliance and then about regulatory. So thank you very much, Amy and Ling Ling. Uh, thank you to everyone who who has been listening today. You know, again, you know, anticipate your risks. Uh, partner with your business people, uh, become an enabler, work with the risk teams. I think you've heard some great things today uh, about you know, how you can continue to elevate your program. So at this point, um, I'd like to turn it over to Bob. Uh, thanks, Adi. Um, I, I wanted to mention, uh, just uh, from a timing standpoint, this uh, opportune. Um, yesterday, we just released the uh, compliance compensation report. So it included uh, you know, just hundreds of chief compliance officers, as well as, um, uh, you know, compliance officers and, and uh, across the nation, across different industries, private companies, public companies. And uh, one of the topics that we, we discussed, uh, that was mentioned was, um, you know, people uh, that have uh, law degrees. And um, we actually included that as part of our compensation survey and uh, CCOs with a law degree uh, earn 26% more than those who don't. Um, and then the compliance officers, uh, likewise, who have a law degree uh, compared to those who don't uh, earn 28% more. So it's pretty consistent, 26, 28%. Um, so it's, it's a pretty significant delta. Uh, so those interested to, uh, you know, that, that may not have Law degrees, it may be something of interest uh, if, you're, if you're looking to, to increase your compensation and, and probably opportunities. Um, and then in general, if, uh, if anyone wants to learn uh, more about how we can assist from a, a recruiting standpoint, um, advising or coaching uh, through services like Kate, uh, Haiti provides, uh, feel free to reach out to me or Haiti you can visit our website and our, our contact information is, is there. Um, and then um, at the conclusion of today, uh, everyone will receive a, an email uh, and just request you to, to take, uh, it's a, about a minute to complete a survey, just uh, give us some feedback on, on uh, how things went, anything we can do uh, to improve, um, things you liked, uh, that, that would be, be helpful. And um, there should also be, I think uh, Taylor, if she hasn't already, is gonna include a link to the compensation report uh, through Zoom here. Um, and, and hopefully everybody did receive an email already or, or will in the next day or so. Um, so again, I really wanna thank uh, Haiti, uh, Ling Ling, as well as uh, uh, Amy for, for sharing all this information today. Uh, and uh, we look forward to having you participate in, in future events in the future for all those who, who joined us today from around the world. Thank you. Th thanks Thank so much. You. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye now. Bye.